for our second COVID-19 response call. Um, my name is Heather Allshuler. I am the Strategic Initiatives Director at the George Pocock Rowing Foundation. Uh, and just in case anyone on this call doesn't know what the GPRF does, uh, we are an organization that is committed to helping forever change the way youth find, start, and stay rowing. Uh, we run various programs, including an American nationwide school program called ERGED that introduces thousands of students to the sport of rowing each year. As well, um, we help youth overcome barriers to participation in the sport, such as cost. Um, and we also have a partner network of boathouses that, um, that are working together to better the sport through being more intentional, inclusive, and innovative. Um, and in that spirit, uh, we are wanting to bring boat houses together and the GPRF felt that the rowing community could benefit from coming together and we wanted to provide a space for us to discuss the situation we have all found ourselves in on this time. Uh, no one has all the answers to what the perfect balance is between social responsibility, uh, government mandates, and maintaining organizational health, sustainability, and for some, uh, survival as we face this unprecedented situation. But today, our hope is to continue to share ideas, ask questions, and create a sense of community and reinforce the idea that we're not in this on our own. We are all part of a strong and healthy rowing community and have never been so much together and in the same boat and situation as before. Uh, the focus of today's conversation is why and how the boathouse can play such an important role in people's lives during this time. The plan for the next hour or so is to hear from Dr. Kevin Allshuler, Associate Professor of Psychology at the University of Washington, and talk, and he's gonna to talk to us a little bit about why the boathouse can play such an important role in people's lives right now. And then we have four coaches from around the US ready to speak a little bit more about the how their boathouses are playing a role in people's lives during this time. Uh, some, a couple housekeeping items before we dive in. Please keep yourself on mute and utilize the chat function to the side. We would love to hear from each of you. However, with such a large group, it can be difficult to keep things progressing if we're all speaking. Um, please be sure to introduce yourself in the, in the chat um, and include your email address if you have not been receiving the emails from me so we can connect with you again about the future calls we have planned. Uh, and we'll also send some follow-up information and slides from this call. So um, feel free also to ask questions and make comments as we go. I will be monitoring the chats uh, as our speakers are speaking. Also, I do want to remind everybody that no one knows all the answers um, or solutions to this. And we want to um, do, make this a time to come together and support each other. Uh, we are all very likely emotionally charged and uneasy about what is happening. So please um, keep this a place free of judgment of what others are doing if you do not agree with their response. All right, um, okay, so with that, uh, let's start things off um, with Dr. Allshuler and why the boathouse can play such an important role in people's lives during this time. So, Kevin. All right, she shoots it upstairs in our house to me. All right, you're on kid duty now. Um, <laughs> it's good to uh, see everybody again uh, this week. And I'm glad to be back to talk about another piece of the psychological challenge of uh, this crisis that we're all finding ourselves in. Um, the title, as you see, is Rowing the Ultimate Bucket Filler. You have no idea what that means right now, but in the next uh, eight to 10 minutes, hopefully it will make perfect sense. Um, the context for this is exactly what Heather was talking about, that there's um, a, a lot of people have this question of like, what are we supposed to do in this situation? And my argument is that um, what we should do should start with the why we, why we do this to begin with, um, why people um, enjoy our sport of rowing, and um, kind of work from there to figure out what the solutions are. So I'm happy to be in the stage setting role, and then I will let all of you come up with uh, how to actually execute the piece. So we're going to talk about three things, uh, the psychological concept of values, um, uh, values, the same concept but applied to sports specifically, 
and then addressing the current challenge in the context of values, at which point I will hand it back off to all of you. So values, many of you are probably familiar with this term in one context or another, but the way we use values is we're talking about the desired qualities of your behavior or the way you want to be as a person in this world to give your life the greatest meaning. And so your values are not what you do, but what you do might represent your values, right? If we're making good choices about our activities, we're doing them because they give us a chance to be this person that we wanna be in the world. So they're not goals, they're not rules, they're not other people's behaviors. They're about you, they're about the why. They're about why you go about the um, things in your life the way that you do. And I should have mentioned at the beginning again, I'll make sure the slides are sent out so you don't have to copy down things like this, uh, this uh, hundreds of words long list. This list uh, shows you um, just a variety of descriptors for values. So people might have values around facing challenges, about their um, freedom, about their um, intelligence, about their reliability, about teamwork, right? And so we each have values about things that are important to us and make our life meaningful. And we're gonna come back to this list in a little while. But the way I think of values is I think of them like buckets. So we each have our own set of buckets and the buckets, each, each bucket represents our own values. Um, one bucket per value. And the fuller each bucket is, the better we feel. So here we have our, our good old popcorn buckets. The full one obviously is better than the empty one. It's also the case that the more buckets we have that are full, the better we feel. So one of the challenges that a lot of people face in life in general is they've gone all in on one bucket, they haven't addressed the others, and life isn't very fulfilling. So we want to fill up as many buckets as we can. So what makes for a good bucket filler, if we're gonna use that terminology? Well, there's two things. One is that a person has to understand their buckets. They have to understand that the activities that they like are probably the activities that fulfill their values, and then dig deeper to understand what are those values? Why do I feel fulfilled when I do that activity? And then the second piece is being psychologically flexible. And what we mean by this is it's a person who's focused on um, changing or continuing in behavior that fits their values. So they're making choices in their life about, about certain activities or certain ways that they're leading their life based on their values, not based on it, the activity itself. So this is where sport comes in because a lot of people find sport to be a great way to meet a number of their value needs. So when we enjoy a sport, we find often that it fills a ton of, of buckets for us. And so here's just kind of broadly, right? It, it um, contributes to our sense of physical well-being, mental well-being, um, our values around teamwork or companionship, our values around having a sense of purpose or challenging ourselves. And as you saw on that list before, there's many more. So if we bring that list back, I was just going through this quickly yesterday and I marked which ones seem like obvious values that are met for a lot of people through the sport of rowing. And I came up with these 38 just right off the bat. So rowing is great for people because it fills 38 different buckets or at least contributes to the filling of 38 different buckets, right? So we have this, right? That's that is a great situation for a person to be in. This is one of the motivators probably for all of us both to be rowers, but also to bring this opportunity to people in our communities. It's also a terrible model if this is an investment because we've gone all in on one thing serving all of these purposes for us, right? So here we are now, now that, that we've been hit with this crisis, those same 38 buckets that were full before are now completely empty, right? So it's just like going in on one blue chip stock, which is great till the market crashes, and then we wish we'd been you know, a little bit more diversified. So that gets to this question that you all are facing today, which is like, now what do we do? What do we do in this situation? 
So let's go back to what I said earlier about being a good bucket filler, right? The first thing is you have to understand your buckets, right? So you may know that you love rowing, you love running your operation. Your coaches might know that they love coaching. Uh, the members know they love being rowers, but do all of you understand why? And so that's the first part. Why is it that I love the sport so much? Why is it that I get so much from it? What is it that I feel like I'm missing now? Understanding what those buckets are and why they're empty. And then the next thing and the more challenging thing, and this is where I think you're gonna end up with a lot of discussion today is this flexibility piece. Right now we're all in, we have one activity filling 38 buckets. But it could be that we have two activities that would each fill 19, or maybe it's gonna take 38 activities to each fill one bucket each. And then each bucket, right now we're using rowing to fill each bucket. But what if we bring in a different activity, right? There's hundreds of sports, and then there's all the things uh, the non-athletes in this world do right that, that they enjoy that could contribute to these same values or these same characteristics so there's hundreds of thousands probably millions of options out there but one of the things that happens is when we care about something we tend to limit down to the things that we know so the flexible person is going to look at these hundreds of thousands or millions of options the less flexible person is trying to figure out how they row without there being rowing available to them. So let's look at that. So if we just take, this is just kind of four domains to think about. We have four values that a person meets are, they're a good teammate, uh, they like being a competitor, they like challenging themselves, and they like to optimize their health or their fitness. Right now, they're under traditional, typical circumstances, they would be getting all of those through rowing. They'd be a good teammate by rowing in a team boat. They'd get to compete at practice and in regattas. They would uh, um, challenge themselves by setting challenging goals as part of their training. And they, they reach their uh, values around health and fitness by training for rowing. The less flexible or more rigid person is saying, how do I replace that rowing, right? So the first thing, right, I have to row in a team boat. Well, this person is just feeling out of luck at this point. All I know for teamwork is to row in a team boat. The competitor piece, I can do it at practice, but we don't have practice. So maybe I'll do an erg challenge. Decent option, one step removed from rowing, not too bad. I like to challenge myself. Okay, so I'm gonna erg and I'm gonna push myself hard. Same thing, right? Um, one step removed from rowing, not a bad idea, but still closely tied to the rowing piece. And the last one, I'm gonna optimize my health and fitness. Well, I'm gonna erg there as well. So what we have with the rigid person is we have rowing-like behaviors, right? Everything that was chosen was almost rowing. Most of us who've rowed a long time probably aren't as big of a fan of the erg as rowing. So it's like one step down from what we would have been looking for on the water. The flexible person has taken a different approach. They are open to anything. Right, so being a good teammate, they like working with people, right? So they're open to social media, FaceTime, a shared challenge, a head-to-head -head challenge. The competitor just wants to compete. I was meeting with a rugby club uh, last week, and honest to God, they came out of this wanting a knitting competition and a baking competition for both the men's and the women's teams. They were so excited about the possibility to compete you could just see everybody brighten up on the call. Now it could also be an erg competition. I'm not against the rowing options. What I'm saying is let's have a, a, a open mind to all of the things that could fill those values. Same thing here for challenging yourself, same thing for health and fitness. It could be erging, it could be something tied closely to rowing, but it could be that we're sharing in our approaches of how to to um, work on challenging ourselves, how we're working on being healthy and being fit. So I know the question's gonna come up, okay, you're saying all these things, but we're here because we have a rowing club to run. And, and I totally get that. Um, and this is, you know, this is true because rowing taps into your coaches and your members' values. 
right? So we're here talking about these things because rowing is so important to everybody. And because these values that map on to rowing uh, map on so well with your members' values. So here's my argument. My argument is that if you help them understand and tap into their values better, you're gonna help them be more fulfilled now and they're gonna understand themselves better for the future. And they're gonna understand that these values were met so well through rowing, right? So if you keep your groups healthy, engaged, eager, I don't think you're gonna lose them because they've opened their minds up to non-rowing things, okay? So you're gonna find rowing solutions, but you're gonna find non-rowing solutions here. And I think the better you do that, the stronger your club is gonna be later on. But remember this, you have to start with yourselves. And this is the old airplane analogy of put your mask on before everybody else's, right? You have to start with yourself. That trickles down to your coaching staff. They need to work on themselves. They need to understand this from their perspective. And then that can go out to your athletes and your members. We can't skip over your stuff. You have to take care of yourself before you can take care of everybody else. So that was the um, background that I wanted to provide. And I'm hoping that that can help kind of open things up for all of you to think both within, but also outside of rowing. Try to take that flexible or open approach where you're really attending to um, what's missing right now for your, for your whole group, yourself, your coaches, your members. And you can really strengthen how that group's doing right now, but also strengthen them as a group so that when things start back up, you have a nice, strong, healthy club. Well, great. Um, any questions from anyone? Um, feel free to type them into the chat or else if you're unable to have the chat function and you're on the phone, feel free to unmute yourself now and ask any questions that you have. All right, well, great. Well, thank you so much, Kevin. Um, you're back on kid duty. <laughs> and uh, Sounds we're gonna, good, bye everybody. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to uh, continue here. And um, so that was a little bit about uh, the why boathouses are so important during this time. And I'd like to bring in some of the directors and coaches we've asked to speak today and ask them some questions about how their boathouses are playing uh, in this role. So I'd like to introduce our four speakers. Um, we have Richard Hall from Olympia Area Rowing in Washington State. Um, we have Emmanuel uh, Valentin, um, sorry, Emmanuel, um, uh, from uh, Saratoga Rowing Association in Florida. We have Beth Anderson from NorCal Crew in California and Jason Kaufman from Mount Baker Rowing and Sailing Center in Seattle, Washington. So uh, thank you all so much for being here and everybody else on this call as well. Um, but to start things off, I would like to ask each of you, how is your boathouse staying connected to your members uh, currently? So I'd like to start things off with Beth. So Beth. Uh, so, hi, I'm Beth. Um, our boathouse right now, the main thing we did was to try to keep the kids engaged, was to create a Google Calendar and then have each coach create activities that we put on that Google Calendar that allows every single kid to join no matter what that activity is. So there's abs, there's ab workouts, there's circuit workouts, there's I think some of the coaches are doing some non working out stuff, but I'm not sure if that's really come into play yet. It gets a little more complicated. Um, the other thing they're doing is they're, they're reaching out to the kids individually, trying to connect with them on a one-on-one -on -one basis um, just to make sure they don't feel isolated and alone. Because I think as we all feel that way, sitting in our houses all day, um, it can get a little bit isolating, especially when they're used to being around hundreds of kids every single day. So um, those are the main things that we're doing just to try to keep everyone engaged. Well, great, well, thank you. Um, Emmanuel, I would love to turn it over to you um, down in Florida. So what, um, how is your boathouse staying connected to your members? Thanks, Heather. Uh, we're in New York. I'm sorry. Saratoga. I, I, That's I, all right. I totally take that back. New York. That's all right. 
Yeah. Uh, um, I'm going to say I'm Canadian. I don't know American geography. All right. no, <laughs> uh, our coaching staff has been excellent. Uh, and they have set up a virtual training center is what we, we called it. Uh, so we've got three components to it. One is we've uh, take, used our Instagram account and we run two workouts a day, uh, 10 at 10, which is a 10 minute core and flexibility at 10 a.m. And then a live at five, a 30 minute body weight circuit in the, uh, at five o'clock in the afternoon. And you, don't, you can just use your Instagram account, tune in, uh, and that's how we've been engaging uh, the kids. Uh, and then uh, the second part is we have a, a Google form where athletes fill in their, their numbers uh, based on the different squads, whether it's varsity boys, varsity girls, masters, fresh from middle school. You kind of fill in the, the minutes you've been working out, whether it's been erging or running or doing whatever you have access to. Uh, and then those Google form uh, connect to our third piece, which is uh, a chart. And it's a, a bar chart that shows the different squads and the different individuals and how they're doing relative to each other. Uh, and then each individual squad has been doing uh, specific things for their own squad. The varsity boys have a, uh, a zoom like this uh, every, every once a week, twice a week, and they all get together and they work out with their computers facing their erg. Uh, and the, uh, the varsity girls do this, the same thing. Uh, they've been using group me in different ways to chat. Uh, our middle school coaches called every family because not every middle schooler has an email. Uh, so we couldn't email them the same. So we had our middle school coaches call every family, connect, and make sure they knew everything that was, that was happening. Awesome. Well, thank you for that. Um, that's great. Uh, Jason, who I know is in Seattle, Washington, um, I will turn it over to you and ask you, how is your boathouse staying connected to your members? Hi. Um, well, I think the big, uh, the big thing that people need to know about our facility is that uh, we're Seattle Parks and we actually are very limited in what we can do with our staff. Our staff are technically off right now. Um, and so our ability to connect with uh, participants and do organized kind of things, like I'm hearing great stuff from other, other facilities, um, is pretty limited. Uh, the coaches did... Um, we're able to give workout plans to uh, the uh, participants before uh, our closure a few weeks ago. Um, but in terms of organized like team activities, that's largely run by the, uh, by the participants themselves, team captains and adults and so forth. What we are doing is we are sending out weekly updates uh, to our email list, basically saying, hey, this is what we're doing, this is what the boathouse is doing. Uh, really just trying to remind them that we're still around um, and that the, the work of the boathouse is continuing. We're doing links with uh, to some other content, workout plans, uh, technical stuff, and so forth. Um, and uh, we're also doing some daily Facebook postings that we're working on right now. Uh, we don't really do Facebook, so we've had to dust off our <laughs> credentials and get that working. Um, this is, that's not my wheelhouse by any means, so it's a uh, that's been, I'm relying on other people, let's say, to make that happen. Um, and then uh, we are actually, uh, right now, um, uh, Helen, our director of rowing, is actually working on getting, um, uh, putting together senior interviews for all of our graduating seniors, because uh, they won't have that kind of year-end closure thing. So we have 16 seniors that we're putting together Zoom interviews for, and we're gonna be posting a couple of those a week. Um, and all that's just to kind of hopefully reinforce some of those cultural things that Kevin was talking about earlier and say, well, what's important about the work that we do? Give those kids a chance to sort of, you know, feel like there's some closure to their experience um, and provide some content that might not, not already be out there. So that's what we're doing. That's great. Um, thank you for a little bit different situation perspective. That's great. Um, Richard Hall. Um, from Olympia Area Rowing. I would love to invite you to share how your boathouse is staying connected to your members. Great, thank you, Heather. Um, so I think we are, like um, many others, are, are been looking for how can we add value. So I, I think our, our perspective um, is that we're going to be in this for the long haul, um, that we're really, I mean, it's, it's a bit of a downer to, to say it, but it's going to probably be 18 months to two years um, before 
we get anything back close to normal. Uh, if you look at the time that it, we're reading, it's going to take uh, to develop a vaccine, which is really what you're going to mass produce vaccine for herd immunity. So, so we've, um, as best we can, as we scramble to take care of the day-to-day -day business, have been thinking about how do we stay connected? How do we continue to add value? Um, how do we communicate um, uh, for the long term to try to develop uh, what we're calling virtual awe? So we have water-based awe when we're on the water, and then we'll have virtual awe, uh, which will be when we're essentially self-isolated um, over the next period of time. So we're doing many things that other people are doing. We've uh, created workout plans. Uh, we have um, Zoom video, uh, home-based circuits. Um, we've actually just got a YouTube channel for, for circuits as well. Um, so there's options there. Uh, we have logs that the, uh, the athletes are filling in. Uh, we um, had several team-wide uh, communication events early on and have uh, moved more and more to, to smaller groups now. Um, we're finding we're very much into, into the Zoom world. Um, we have a GroupMe um, group set up for, for the different groups so we can be communicating um, uh, on a text-based uh, basis. Um, and one of the things that uh, we also did was we reached out through our parent uh, group. So our parent rep identified six leads who all contacted seven other families. So we try to communicate on the parent side as well as the, um, uh, as well as the athlete side. And we found a couple of cases where kids were getting a little bit you know, isolated or, or left out um, through the parents. We were able to kind of bring them back in that way. So uh, we're going to have a parent um, fireside chat this coming uh, Thursday. Um, so we're, we're going to have a big Zoom call for, for all the parents. Um, and um, yeah, and on the, um, one of the things we, we, we did find was, um, as, we, as we talk about where can you add value, we're finding that it, uh, the more we make an iterative process and involve the athletes in that, um, the, uh, the faster we, we kind of respond. So some of the things that, uh, we have a very creative uh, group of coaches, some of the things that we came up with, uh, when you actually ask the kids, they weren't seeing that much value in them uh, and other things that they want to invent themselves. So we created a virtual or Instagram account, a private Instagram account uh, where the kids basically go play. And so they ran a competition, for example, last week, which was the most innovative use of home furniture in a, in a circuit and uh, just find ways to kind of uh, connect around that. Um, what we're also hearing loud and clear is uh, the athletes are looking to us for programming uh, and direction and to help them meet their goals. Um, but for a lot of the social side, they're taking care of that themselves. We're providing a few platforms for them, but they're, they're finding their groups and we're just, you know, we're just enabling that. Um, so we're actually now moving towards, it was interesting hearing about the, the senior plans there. We're moving towards uh, now creating custom uh, uh, training programs. Um, talk about. So we have uh, one program for um, uh, athletes that are going off to college. Realistically, that's going to be uh, just aerobic-based development. We've got looking at our um, <coughs> rising seniors, the current juniors um, that are interested in running in college. They're going to have no on the water results this spring, so 2K erg results are unfortunately going to be critical. So we're putting together a custom program for them to to produce good erg scores in uh, in the middle of the summer, and then other athletes have other goals, uh, just turning them into aerobic monsters. There's a little chat going around our boat club about the uh, Arabic monster program, which, uh, which some of our younger, younger folks want to get involved in. So that's the, that's the whole thing. We're, we're trying not, we thought we'd try to create a boathouse feel online and that, that uh, is turning to something different. And we also got a little bit of branding going. Um, so this is, if I can click the right button, this is virtual or you can see behind me, there's a little logo there, virtual or. Olympic area uh, So it's great parent designed this for us. The one thing we can't figure out is how we can get the chevron not to kind of stick in your ear as you're talking here. But um, that's, so that's the biggest problem we have, then, uh, then we'll take that. Well, that's great. Well, thank you. Um, we have had a couple questions in the chat and I please encourage everyone to continue with that. Uh, one was answered um, back from Emmanuel about asking about paid participants versus unpaid. Um, content out there um, and he did say that all of the Instagram workouts and everything that are posted are all open sourced um, so non-members can access them um, however the Google Forms and team workouts are athlete and team specific um, also um, there was a question for you, um, you Richard uh, what type of uh, topics are you covering with parents 
Uh, it's going to be a fairly open agenda. It's going to really be hearing uh, what they want to, to, to learn more about. We're, we're going to talk about the, the long-term vision or the, what we call it our long-term 18-month expectation. And again, I just caveat this as, as everybody is, is doing uh, appropriately, which is no one really knows. We're super hopeful that maybe through human ingenuity, something will, something will uh, get us back full-time on the water uh, faster. But, but you know, uh, absent that, then we, we just wanted to plan for that. So we're also going to talk about economics. I think we're going to see, see a different economic uh, environment uh, with families themselves. Um, and so how do we make that work? Um, and then uh, one of the other areas that our parents have generally been fairly heavily involved in is uh, community um, focused um, endeavors. Uh, and so identifying what can we do as a rowing club, parents uh, and families and athletes uh, all together uh, to play a role in uh, in our community above and beyond just wanting to get fit and make boats go fast. Well, fabulous. Thank you for sharing that. Um, I would like to turn it back to Beth. Um, and Beth, I would like to ask you, how are you staying connected to your staff and coaches through this time? It's a really good question. I think they feel actually more isolated than the kids do. Um, they're pretty used to having a lot of face-to-face -face time every day at the boathouse and doing things. Um, as a group, we do a lot of, of, we do a weekly coaches meeting. So we've just turned that into a Zoom meeting once a week. Um, I, I feel like that's one of, the, one of the subjects that I, this week have decided we really need to sort of wrap our heads around. We started using Slack to sort of allow people to flush out ideas when they have time. Um, which has been really great. It's, it's, they give you a great deal as nonprofit. Actually, it's free right now. So we've been using Slack, we've been using Zoom, um, and obviously emails and, and that. The, the coaches have been amazing um, as far as being really intuitive. The other thing that the coaches started using with the athletes, and it's helping with the coaches as well, is a program called Strava where the kids can actually input all of their athletic stuff and they can sort of compare each other. It's a whole athletic program that one of the coaches was using. And now I think we have most of the kids in there. So we can do all our competitions through that. So that also helps keep the coaches engaged with each other. Um, but yeah, that's a hard part. It's really hard. Absolutely. Well, thank you for sharing. Um, Jason, given you're in a little bit different situation being a city department uh, boathouse, um, could you share how you are staying connected with staff and coaches or if you are able to? Um, yeah, we are. It's, uh, but it's kind of a one way street right now. Um, you know, that working within the city, uh, myself and two of our, uh, administrative staff are city staff. So we're still working, uh, actually full-time jobs, but a lot of our work is being dictated by the city right now. Um, and a lot of the city's work is being, geared more and more toward providing uh, shelter services, shower services for community and so forth. So um, my work and the work of a couple of my staff are uh, split largely between, between what we're doing with the boathouse and what we need to do to serve the, um, the greater community. And then on the, the coaching side, those coaches are hired by a different organization. I'm not going to get into the details of it, but um, those are largely the guys that are that are off. I have two uh, coaches who are still doing some work for us um, uh, and so forth. But um, but really, just like we're doing with our uh, participants, we're trying to um, keep them up to date on what the projects are, what we're doing to try and make the boathouse better during this time. Um, even when we don't have access to the facility right now, I'm locked out of my facility. I can't get in. So. Um, the, the things that, I, that we can do, we're trying to share those and how we're making our uh, operations a little bit more efficient and what we're doing to, to make things better when, when everybody gets back so that the coaches feel like there's something to look forward to down the road. Um, and then just encouraging them to um, uh, communicate well with the participants about, you know, um, you know, uh, encourage them to have safe practices uh, and so forth, especially with the kids. Sometimes they they're still need some prompting uh, about what uh, distancing means and looks like. So uh, by and large, our staff have done a great job with that. And I think they've been very flexible, but um, it's tough because we can't utilize them um, in the same way that they would like to do and the way that um, I think some other facilities are able to. So, yeah. 
Well, great. Well, thank you for sharing that perspective. Um, Richard, I'd like to sort of twist it a little bit about um, build on that staying connected with staff, but also just sort of what are your thoughts in terms of um, co coaches all returning once doors do open and sort of what's, what's your hope with all of that? And are you concerned around that and keeping your staff and coaches um, employed and engaged and coming back? Uh, the short answer to that is, is yes. Um, so, uh, but then how we go about that is, is, uh, is obviously uh, uh, you know, where the rubber meets the road on this. So uh, what we're beginning to do is look at, um, if we take that 18 month kind of virtual or on the water or model, um, then what we're looking at is when we're in virtual or um, we can have coaches fill different roles. Um, so we're looking at maybe coaches becoming more functional uh, around that. And if we're creating enough value, you know, even in a distressed economic um, environment, I think we, we can, um, we're hopeful that we'll have virtual or be a, a viable economic entity of itself. So we can actually employ coaches to, to fill roles in there, whether it's kind of the, the video channel uh, person or whether it's someone that's really working, uh, you know, different groups, different workouts. Um, and I should say, by the way, as, as we look, we uh, uh, have both masters and juniors in our program, and I think we're seeing uh, very different needs between masters and juniors and ways that they consume the information, um, and let alone within the junior group, starting to see some uh, some different groups evolve. So how we line up staff-wise around that is, is, is going to be critical. Um, I think where we are is you know, we, we need to keep our core group of coaches um, uh, active and engaged, uh, and we're going to do the best we can around that. Um, the biggest concern we have is, is as we come into the summer, whether we can actually run summer novice camps. And obviously there's, there's a number of people that uh, generally come back uh, from college and coaching that, that I'm, that I'm not sure how we're, we're going to cope that this summer. Well, thank you for that. Um, Emmanuel, I'd like to sort of turn it to you now. A uh, similar question. Um, first of all, this, the staff and the coaching question, how, are, how is everyone staying engaged? Um, also, are you concerned about just sort of the sustainability and engagement piece long-term for getting back to full capacity at some point? Yeah, those are really hard questions. Uh, I can speak more on the first one than I can the second one, just because of my role at, at the club. Uh, I am more staff than I am director in, in terms of the whole boathouse. Uh, but we all got uh, put on, on leave for, for a while now, just like uh, most of us are going through. Uh, Slack has been awesome. That has been something I wish we had, we had years ago because uh, I don't know how many times a decision maker is at a regatta, uh, whether it's me or it's our executive director or any, you know, being able to communicate with each other uh, easily. That's not 14 different text message threads that has one person that's different in each one. Uh, being able to centralize everything uh, and keep ideas moving, not being together has been uh, an awesome tool that we've added. And we uh, are making an effort that the effort, what the work we're putting in now towards learning Slack isn't just to get us through, the, through this, but it's something that we keep when we return to normalcy. Like how do we keep this tool uh, and keep using everything that we, we've learned? Uh, and in terms of the keeping the coaching staff engaged, uh, each, each, our, our social media, we have a social media person. Uh, she handles our, our Instagram and uh, every coach gets a different workout and they, they, they're they taking different time slots uh, and they get to come up with that workout. They're, they're the ones calling the kids uh, and making sure that everyone's uh, connected. They're, everyone's, they're hearing from a coach that the, the parents are still getting value for their for their, their membership. Uh, the coaches have, have just done an incredible job with that. Uh, in terms of how we're gonna return back to normal, that's a, that's a great question. I, I don't know. Uh, and that's, that's the answer I have, I don't know. Very fair, that's, I don't think anybody really knows, right? Um, so fair enough. Um, I'd like to um, pose one more question to all four of our panelists today. Um, and that is, um, at this point in this process, what has been the best platform or tool uh, for staying connected to e either coaches, members, um, 
everybody out there. Um, so let's let's go ahead and uh, start with Jason. So what sort of has been your your best tool that you've been using? Well, we're uh, again the, we're sort of given the tools that we have. Um, the uh, you know I've been spending most of my time on either Skype or Zoom uh, over the last uh, three weeks. Um, again, as a city of Seattle employee, I've, I've given the you know, Skype is what the city uses, and it is frustrating, uh, but it gets the job done. Um, I'm you know Zoom has been great for you know things like this, or to you know out to a broader audience, easier to use, and so forth. But um, again, with the nature of our program and and how limited we are on the staffing side and what we can do, everything's been had to be much more one way rather than interactive. Um, and so email, it's been the old standbys of email, um, you know, now Facebook, Instagram, and so forth, things to put out there to to um, that people can sort of see the work that we're doing, that we can share some of the work that we're doing and hopefully keep them engaged with um, uh, with that so that they have something to look forward to. Uh, when, whenever we open our doors and whatever that looks like um, and whatever they're ready to do at that point, um, that they know that we'll be there uh, for them when it comes time to come back, so. Well, great, well, thank you for that. Um, Beth. What is sort is uh, at this point been your best sort of platform or tool that you've been using to stay connected? I think Zoom has been, probably been the best, and also Google. The Google Calendar is great because everyone can just put it on their phone, and as people add things and delete things, it can just go. Um, people can join and do whatever they want to do. So we try to put every activity into that one Google Calendar so that anyone can add. So I think. Although we've been using Zoom, they've been using um, the other apps. I think that the best one for the kids has really been the fact that everything's located in the Google Calendar. That's great, thank you. Emmanuel, same question. You sort of alluded to this a little bit before, but best platform or tool you've been using to stay connected? Yeah, uh, with the coaches, it's, it's been Slack. Uh, and on top of that, Trello, uh, on how uh, Trello is a project management tool that we have been starting with and now have all this extra time uh, to really dive deep and, and make sure that it's something we can carry forward with us. Uh, with the, the kids, the coaches have been using text message, uh, whether it's group me or, or a remind something that that's going directly to their phone with our middle schoolers, I should call them. You know, we actually called uh, parents and, and, and spoke with the kids. Uh, and that that's what we've been doing over here. That's great. Well, thank you. Over there in New York, not Florida. Um, <laughs> Richard, I'm going to turn it. Same question to you. What's been the best uh, platform or tool for staying connected for you and your club? Zoom is Zoom is the new one. It's uh, fantastic. We we've used that in in uh, increasing number of ways. We use GroupMe, uh, which has worked out well. Um, I think the uh, and coaches uh, we've use Google Docs a lot already, uh, and that's just um, continued to, to go down that. So just that's a work, you know, the work for just work planning and so on. Uh, the one area that I'm interested to see how it develops is um, uh, one of our coaches um, uh, is very facile in the in the video world, and we've a Dropbox to YouTube um, uh, system for uh, coaching the kids on ergs at home. So the kid and the athletes can take videos of their erg, erging, um, send it to Dropbox folder, goes out onto a private channel, and they can work with the, the enemy to, to give them feedback. So, uh, well, and we're just trying a bunch of seeing what sticks. Well, great, well, thank you for that. Um, I encourage everyone to continue using that chat function to ask questions. Um, we did have one general question um, asking about the uh, Paycheck uh, Protection Program under the SBA CARES Relief Program. Um, we are actually, um, we'll, uh, we'll have uh, someone coming on in a couple minutes to discuss more specifics. Um, we're gonna have a, a call next week about specifically this and some of the other just si financial side of things um, that we're gonna put together. Um, more details will follow in just a couple minutes from now, but I just see some of the comments about the PPP loan out there. Um, and that is something we would love to have every, everyone who's interested come back and discuss as well. 
Um, also, um, we do have a question for Richard. Um, can you say a little more regarding your use of Dropbox um, for the video content? Uh, yes, so uh, you can just set up Dropbox, uh, and I see a couple of questions come in here. So it's an account that we um, we do pay for. We just have to the coach that's uh, running it has a power user uh, account. So um, <clears throat> so we drop the uh, the athletes just have a URL that they basically post the um, the video to. It goes into the Dropbox, and then there is a manual uh, action where a uh, coach actually drags it over onto the uh, into the YouTube into a YouTube uh, channel um, and codes that just so that the all the coaches can see it um, and uh, exclusively just the athlete uh, who created it we just didn't want to create a, a social media issue where athletes were able to see each other's workouts and it ending up in the wrong place at the wrong time in the wrong way so um, so again that's the basic process and then in terms of getting back with the athlete um, then uh, by email with just um, comments um, is, is one way or, or through group me or tech, uh, DMing. Um, we have talked about feedback and, uh, and then straight into the safe sports uh, aspects of that as well. Um, we don't want to go to one on one, uh, one -on -one, uh, Zoom calls with athletes. So we have two coaches with, with the athlete uh, over Zoom or we could have more athletes at the same time with the coach. Great. Well, thank you for that, Richard. Um, wonderful. Well, thank you so much to the four panelists. If you do have any questions, feel free to continue dropping them into the comments. Um, if you are on a phone, um, feel free to unmute yourself and ask your question at this time, um, since I know not everyone has access to that comment box. All right. Um, oh, yeah, what? here's one. Go ahead. Um, just, just on the topic of having meetings, Zoom meetings with athletes, um, I'm trying to decide whether or not I think it's reasonable to have a one-on-one -on -one meeting with an athlete if we record the meeting on Zoom. Do you think that that is reasonable or uh, unwise? Who controls the recording, I think, is kind of a question there. Yeah, um, so Jason was talking about who's recording the uh, recording. Um, also, Richard, do you have anything to add since you were talking about that safe sport side of things with the protocol you've set into place with your club? Yes, yeah, so we're, we're thinking quite hard around this because obviously it gets very clumsy very quickly um, and potentially the, the athletes are not in, in, the, in the best position of your, of your being limited about it. So one thing that we, so we're starting with the, with the, with the position that we've got to have, um, you know, it's a two on one over Zoom, um, but we're also exploring the option of if the parent is aware the Zoom call is taking place, you know, it's, so there's, <coughs> Short answer is we don't quite know where we're going to go on this, uh, but I'm pretty sure we're going to find ways to to facilitate a, an easier way to just have uh, conversations over Zoom with athletes. Oh, great. Anyone else like to add anything um, else to that perspective um, about this topic? Yeah, go uh, ahead, Delaney. Uh, yeah. Hi, Delaney. I also work for the GPRF. Um, I run the scholarships and our community partnerships. I think one thing you do wanna be careful about when speaking about having any stored kind of information on youth is what kinds of permissions you've had from their parents. Um, because unless you have that explicitly stated somewhere in what they've already signed, you storing a recording of them is questionable. Um, I think the two to one ratio is obviously kind of difficult to figure out online but that would probably be the way that I would lean as the scholarships manager. Um, our, our best practices is we always include the parent in any kind of communication. Um, obviously, you know, not every athlete is going to be super comfortable having their parent there for a meeting, um, but definitely something to think about. Thank you, Delaney, for that. Um, also, uh, Jason Kaufman just put up a chat saying that they are actually um, obtaining uh, different um, releases for their senior interviews that they're doing. Um, and also he stated um, the parent being present is a great way to handle that as well. So certainly uncharted territory for um, many clubs and a great point to th be thinking about how sort of the, the way you would each like to handle that with your specific club. Wonderful. Well, thank you for that. Um, 
now sort of talking a little bit, getting back to that engagement piece, um, I would like to invite Ben Steele of Vashon Island Rowing Club to share one resource that he and David D. Winter from Sammamish Rowing Association has put together um, that is, wel uh, is welcoming everybody to participate in. So um, Ben, I will turn it over to you. Hi everybody. So uh, if I haven't met you, my name's Ben, um, and some of you might have already seen an email from me earlier or later last week. Um, so David approached me uh, with a phone call asking, you know, how can we engage not just our boathouse but our community? And you know, everybody has started coming up with Zoom workouts and home workouts and home meetings to keep kids engaged with their own club. Um, and so we kind of started brainstorming and started going in the idea of, well, what if we could engage the entire Northwest or greater uh, in a challenge that encourages people with access to equipment and people who do not have access to equipment to participate with each other. Um, so the basics um, is that we have five or six boathouses now for sure interested. And it would be a points-based challenge where different workouts count for certain things. And it's uh, just geared to get as many people and as many kids active and involved, uh, being inclusive to those who can't get that ERG, can't log those meters. I know there's a lot of virtual ERG challenges going on in the greater rowing community right now. But this is a way to take the next step and include everybody. Uh, so David has a lot of the nitty gritty details of how it's going to work. And uh, I'd like to invite him to share some of that stuff with you now. And then uh, we'll give a little bit more info and answer some questions after that. Sure. Thanks, Ben. So for those of you who don't know me, my name is David DeWinter. I've been a coach at Sammamish Rowing Association, both juniors and masters for over the past five years. Taking some time off now to build a rowing tech company called Row Hero, but uh, I'm, as Ben said, I talked to to him last week because I saw this pattern that well, lots of regattas were going to get canceled. Writing was on the wall that regionals was going to, unfortunately, fall by the wayside for the juniors this year, and um, we were really trying to think how can we do something like like th there are these virtual challenges that are popping up, but we're seeing that. And from the kids that I've talked to that it's not really as engaging when it's not the sort of familiar boathouses and clubs and teams that you're used to competing against year after year. So that's why Ben and I sort of put this idea together of how do we get kids involved um, trying to compete against each other, but also connect with their teams um, over the next month or so for sort of a, a virtual regionals. Um, I'm not going to go super deep into the details here. I will send a document out in the chat. Um, in a couple of minutes so you guys can look at that. But as Ben said, the idea is that it's points based. So, and we're rewarding effort more so over speed. So, and we're also um, tailoring, tailoring it in a way so that different people, regardless of what equipment they have, they can participate at whatever level that they're comfortable with. We also want to focus on more than just exercising. I think that's really common, but as a lot of us know as coaches, um, being an athlete is not just about being fast or being competitive. It's also being a good representative of your boathouse and the community. And so there's also ways that we're trying to incentivize um, better sort of citizenship as athletes based on um, sort of nutrition, mental health, involving your family in activities, especially as we're all going through this challenging time. Um, the one other thing I'm going to add is I know a lot of us are really busy with trying to figure out how do we keep our boathouses running during this time and yet another thing might just be the straw that breaks the camel's back at this point. Um, ben and I have really tried to make this as self-managed for the athletes as possible so you guys as coaches can be as involved as you want to be or or be more on the sidelines. Um, the one thing I will ask, I'm going to send the document out in the chat right now, but the one thing I will ask is if there are things that Ben and I can be doing to help like engage your athletes and get them more interested and motivated about participating in this challenge, then please let us know. Um, we're, our goal is to start this next Monday. 
get entries in by this Friday at 11.59 p.m. And so over the course of this week, um, you guys will have access to our email addresses. Please contact us, let us know um, what we can do to help uh, get everyone together. Because I think the more boathouses and people in the community we can get together, the more fun we can make this for our kids. Thanks everybody. Awesome, well thank you you guys and thank you for putting that together to bring the community together and help alleviate some of the pressure from other coaches. Um, so um, David, we'll put that in that chat um, function and you can click on that and check it out um, or also email them like they said. Um, next, um, I would like to um, invite Matt Lacey of the GPRF to speak a little bit more about our next call we have planned for next Monday, specifically around the PPP um, uh, programs that are out there. So Matt. Okay, hi everybody. Um, I noticed that a couple uh, of you have applied for the payroll protection program, uh, and there are actually a number of other resources and tools uh, that are becoming available that um, that we're learning about uh, pretty quickly. And so this might not be the best call for everybody here, but maybe if you've got a board treasurer or uh, a president that might uh, be navigating uh, the payroll <laughs> was I kicked out of my house. Yes, Jason. Thank you. This is honestly the most quiet place I could possibly be. Uh, so at this point, I'm just offending the neighbors. Um, so next week for the uh, for the call, what I was thinking um, would be great to focus on. Uh, I mean, from what I'm aware of, not only is there the PPP, there's a disaster relief loan program that's also available uh, for some of the organizations that might not be a 501c3. Uh, there are some different rules coming out um, for uh, uh, donors. Uh, rules for charitable contributions are changing, and so that might help uh, some of the smaller clubs connect with some donors um, and just try to get some support that allow them to bridge over to the summer uh, or maintain some of that staff that we're, uh, we're all hoping to do uh, and keep as many people on as possible. So next week we'll have Rachel Lemieux. Uh, she's a CPA. She's the coach for Martha's Moms out here in the Northwest, but she's... Uh, this in her professional life, this is what she's doing at this moment, uh, coming out with uh, all the tools, everything from the uh, the PPP program all the way down into uh, just payroll tax uh, credits uh, that you're going to be able to get by the end of the year. And every little piece, um, I think, is going to help. So uh, Rachel will be there to lay out a map um, of what some of those uh, tools and supports are going to look like. Uh, we'll have Eric Poon, who's the treasurer for the Pocock Foundation. Uh, also a CPA uh, around to help, and most likely Dwight Phillips. Um, Dwight is a member of the rowing community, but he's also a small business uh, lender for Columbia Bank. And if uh, some folks haven't been able to connect with the PPP yet, maybe because their bank um, isn't connected to the Small Business Association, uh, Dwight can start helping you understand who to connect with and what you might need in order to get there. So it might be a little bit of a shorter meeting, probably about 10 minutes, uh, 15 minutes of talking through the tools, and then we'll be just available for question and answer on uh, basically maybe what we can do or how we can help uh, get everybody navigated to those tools uh, because they're pretty impactful. Well, so we great. hope to see you next week. Well, great. Well, thank you, Matt. So yeah, just to follow up with that, um, I'd like to invite everyone back um, who would like to hear more about that financial side of things uh, next Monday at 1130. I will be sending out those links. Um, we also are going to have an, another um, meeting three weeks from now on April 27th. And we're going to look a little bit more on sort of reopening plans and potential summer programming and what that could look like. Um, since chances are it's not going to be business as usual, even once doors start to open up. Um, and I will be sending out those RSVP links um, for both calls um, to the mailing list. So if you have not been receiving the emails, please just pop it into the comment box. You can just privately send it to me if you don't want it out there for everyone. Um, we will also be posting the links on our website, pocockfoundation.org, um, later today. Um, so few ways to get connected to that. Um, and finally, I would just like to say thank you to each and every one of you on this call. Um, you know, there's a lot on all of your plates, um, but I hope that 
you know, you can feel the strong rowing community that we are all fortunate enough to be a part of. Um, you know, there certainly is a feeling of isolation and being alone at this time, but uh, we truly have never been so united as a world um, as we are right now. So the GPRF is certainly committed to giving all boathouses the best chance possible to be sustainable and strong to get through this. So when things do return to whatever the new normal is going to look like, um, we can still get hundreds of youth and rowers of all ages back on the water um, and part of our incredible and connected communities once again. So please stay connected um, as we all work our way through this. We hope to see you next week or in three weeks time, um, but feel free in the meantime to email me with any questions, heather at pocockfoundation.org, um, or if you just need anything or really are wanting specific topic areas, we're trying to pull coaches and directors to see what you guys need. This is your space. We want this to be your space um, and give you the information you need to get through this. So thanks again for calling in and we hope everyone stays healthy uh, until we see you next time. All right. Thanks so much, everyone.